Good evening, everybody. This is Dr. Michael Cromer, family physician and president of the Hillsborough County Medical Association. Thank you for joining us tonight for this uh, pertinent and interesting webinar on the topic of the COVID-19 vaccine and the distribution plan here in Hillsborough County. We're happy to, happy to have uh, three panelists and let me introduce them at this time. We have uh, Mr. Ryan Pedigo, who's the director of the Public Health uh, Preparedness um, uh, Committee and Department for the Florida Department of Health Hill, in here, here, here in Hillsborough County. Welcome, Ryan. We also have Dr. Douglas Holt, the health officer for the Florida Department of Health here in Hillsborough County. Welcome, D Doug. And we also have uh, Dr. John Sennett, epidemiologist and chairman of the uh, Department of Internal Medicine at the Morsani College of Medicine at USF. Happy to have you again with us, John. Thank you. Okay, the primary topic as we uh, market it, is it going to be that concerning the vaccine distribution, first for this Pfizer uh, vaccine, and then um, later, hopefully, uh, later this week for the Moderna vaccine. And one person that has been um, instrumental in formulating the distribution plan is Ryan Pedigo. Um, I'm sure he's been working on this for many months, um, along with uh, the, he, he's also in charge of our hurricane disaster plan here, here in Hillsborough County. So it's been quite um, a few busy months for you, I'm sure. Um, throw in the uh, sort of the curveball that, the uh, good curveball that um, Governor DeSantis threw in a couple weeks ago when he moved up the, the risk or the, uh, the phasing of uh, people age 65 and older with high risk factors up into the phase one or uh, so into the tier one distribution. So we are excited to hear what you have in store for us to uh, educate us. For those of you who may or may not be new to Zoom platform, at the bottom of your screen there, if you move your pointer a little bit, um, some icons will come on including participants, a chat box, etc. If you have a question during this time that you'd like to ask and you haven't sent it in ahead of time, please press your left um, pointer to that chat box. It'll expand, type in your questions and I will be um, reading through those and, and asking um, Ryan pertinent questions at the end of his presentation. So with that, uh, Ryan Padigo, I turn it over to you, thank you. Hey, thank you, Dr. Comer, and, and welcome everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to, for me to get in front of you to make this presentation. Um, I'm gonna try to give you as much information as we know about which vaccine is coming in, who is it for, where is it going, and kind of our strategies on how we're gonna get it there. Um, if you watch the news, it seems like every afternoon there is another press conference, which changes us up a little bit. So we quickly scramble, scramble around. Uh, but just to let you know, we've been working with Hillsborough County on this since the beginning on all aspects of the COVID response. And the vaccine is gonna be no different. We are working directly with emergency management. We have a task force that is formed to address various things. Um, kind of go over the priority groupings with everyone because as Dr. Comer indicated, uh, the governor did change up the priority a little bit. Um, the first priority, priority 1A, is long-term care residents. Um, priority 1B, healthcare workers, high risk, high contact areas. This is inclusive of both long-term care staff as well as hospital staff. So these are the main focus of the state right now today. Um, priority 1C, age 65 and older, and those with underlying health conditions. When we start thinking about it from a vaccine standpoint, we're not getting a lot of vaccine into the state of Florida right now. Uh, we got very little actually. We got 170,000 plus or minus doses initially and as it was announced yesterday, um, it looks like Pfizer is having some issues with their manufacturing and logistics system. And so our next two expected shipments are gonna be delayed. 
So as you look at the bottom of your screen along this timeline, these are really our best guesses of when vaccine would start to be available to the various priority groupings. Um, priority two, critical infrastructure organizations. Those are the organizations that keep us going. They keep our roadways going. They keep our power on. Um, they keep us moving. Uh, education is also one of those groups, um, both higher education as well as K through 12, private schools, daycares, those types of settings. And then vulnerable populations, which is a very broad category, um, but can include uh, racially um, disparate populations. Um, Dr. Holt will be talking a little bit about it when he's getting into his um, epidemiology update on the Hispanic population. We're just getting tremendous number of cases in that group of people, but we also know there's areas around our county, zip codes specifically, that have health disparities and high incidence of minorities coupled with diabetics and other different types of chronic diseases. So that's gonna be kind of priority two as we move in and vaccine becomes more available. As we go into priority three, we're talking about the general population. Um, if you were around during H1N1 2009, when we were receiving vaccine, we were actually vaccinating the pods using a pod system or a point of dispensing system for the public at high schools. And we went around the county for about two and a half months giving everyone the vaccines. We're not expecting that until later in the year, um, later in this time frame, probably around the second quarter of the calendar year, starting April, May time frame. Um, but that's kind of how it's broken out. And you can imagine these are huge populations of people um, that have to be identified we have to set priority tiers within these groups in order to identify who should be vaccinated first or who's gonna help us vaccinate them. As we start talking about supply and distribution though, um, as the supply comes in down to the lower left of your screen, we're talking the long-term care facilities, uh, ALFs, nursing homes, independent living facilities and intermediate care. This federal government has set up a contract with CVS and Walgreens to vaccinate all of these facilities nationwide. Here we find that Walgreens and CVS, which were supposed to have started already, um, could not pull it together logistically. And the state has created strike teams made up of contracted nursing staff, National Guard folks, um, and they're gonna be kind of the bridge between the time the pharmacies can get going and vaccine available, there's gonna be about two weeks. Right now, the state has allocated approximately 60,000 doses for that pharmacy program off the initial shipment that we received earlier this week. It is the Pfizer vaccine. And what we're gonna be doing is until the CVSs and Walgreens can get started, we're actually sending strike teams out now. Um, the first one went into Pinellas County today. They've been designated as a pilot county for long-term care facilities. And they're starting their vaccines over there. Um, as more vaccine becomes available, that's gonna be brought out into Hillsboro, Pasco, Pinellas, Manatee, other counties in our region to help spread it out. Healthcare workers and a closed point of dispensing, that's what a pod is, a closed point of dispensing, meaning it's not open to the public or others other than that designated target group. So we know Tampa General received a um, quantity of vaccines. They have identified a certain number that they can provide to other facilities. And right before this call, uh, the governor released a press release 
which uh, listed all the other hospitals who will be getting vaccines very soon uh, throughout the state. There was a um, slight change in our plan on that, and that's okay. Uh, he's going to be pushing it out to all of these facilities on the next round of vaccines coming in. And then we start talking about within that tier 1B category, the critical health care, high risk, high high um, exposed healthcare workers, we've got first responders because those EMS drivers, paramedics, they're really the first contact with a certain group of individuals who may or may not have COVID and bring them out to the EDs. So those are a critical group that we need to make sure that we're vaccinating. As the supply increases, um, then we're going to start targeting the local group of 65 and older with comorbidities um, through local closed pods. These are pods that we will be setting up in conjunction with the county, um, in conjunction with the medical community. And our community partners will play a huge role in this, but it's really once that vaccine becomes available. Um, Right now with that delay on Pfizer, it's gonna be about a two week delay on that. And the governor is going to reallocate the Moderna vaccine to put it down into the priority 1A and 1B initially. Um, we all know about the Raymond James testing site um, that is run by the state of Florida, staffed by the state of Florida, and they are looking at converting that into a vaccination site as well. So it's going to be a, a kind of a large operation, a lot of moving parts, uh, a lot of groups and coordination that has to occur to get that vaccine out. As we move further in and get more vaccine, we're looking at the critical infrastructure pods, looking at Heartline, Tampa International Airport, the Port Authority, um, Sunshine Line, the Medicare transportation system. All those groups, universities, play a huge role in keeping us going. So we're gonna be looking at those groups and how can we vaccinate them? Um, as the vaccine becomes more plentiful starting in, we're guessing around March. Um, that's where private providers who register with us can actually order and receive the vaccine directly into your office without it coming through the Department of Health as part of a target group effort. And then once we get into April, we're pretty confident that it's gonna be an expanded retail delivery system. So commercial pharmacies will have it and people will actually be able to order it directly from the company about that point. It won't be so controlled by the government, but at that point, it's gonna become, think of it like an influenza vaccine. It's gonna be very, very plentiful and we are anticipating the demand to drop off once we get into that area. So what we're currently been doing, um, we are setting up work groups to identify different strategies to work with the various target populations. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, in Hillsborough County, long-term residents and staff make up about 20 to 23,000 individuals. Um, in hospitals, there's about 30,000 individuals. When we start moving into the age 65 and older group, we're talking about 206,000 individuals. Um, that, that's a huge, huge number. And while we may be able to set up some community open to those, that group points of dispensing where individuals could drive to it, it would take months to work our way through that entire population. Um, so we would be setting up a work group, looking for support and membership from large providers, hospitals, uh, to participate with us to develop those strategies to hit those target populations. We already have a work group going for first responders, and they're going to be moving into critical infrastructure. 
Um, but there's also another subgroup to that that we have to look at, and that's private providers and ancillary services, ancillary medical services that are offered to the public, such as dialysis centers. Um, we really need to start focusing on that and come up with strategies on how to do that. We need you as providers to register with Florida Shots as a vaccine for adult and vaccine for children providers. That's the only way we can really identify you and get vaccine out to you, or once it's available, where you can order it through that program. Um, one of the things we're gonna be doing within the next week is we are going to be developing a survey. And Dr. Cromer, I haven't told you this yet, but we're gonna be enlisting the medical association to help us distribute that survey, which is gonna ask very specific questions about your practice, your patients, um, your willingness to participate with us, your willingness to enroll in the Florida Shots program. And uh, hopefully with that data, once we get to the table, we can sit down with the planning group and make some very clear decisions on how we're gonna get the vaccine to you and who will be getting the vaccines. Um, we're not trying to exclude anyone, but you can imagine we can't have a, a planning team of 99 people um, where we have to kind of focus on various areas in size at this point. So I'm gonna go ahead and do one more slide, uh, which will kind of give you a idea of the two different vaccines. A couple of things I wanna point out on the Pfizer vaccine, you know, there is a delay in it and the governor has made the decision to switch over to the Moderna for the remainder of the hospitals and the long-term care. Um, that's gonna delay some things for us in, in our planning because there was about 370,000 doses due to Florida next week. Um, that's 370,000 doses now that are going to be shift to a higher priority, which is not necessarily an issue, but it's going to delay our capability of getting the vaccine out there. And the handling of the Moderna is much easier. Many more providers can do this. The Pfizer, you know, you have to have that ultra cold freezer. And uh, while most hospitals have that, many, many, many doctors, offices, practices do not have that capability. So it's very difficult for us to use the Pfizer vaccine on a widespread basis. Um, there's no real known uh, safety concerns. There were two individuals in the UK that did have adverse reactions and it was just reported late this afternoon that a nurse at a hospital who received the vaccine had an anaphylactic reaction. Uh, not a lot of information on there, but one of the things that this vaccine does is it does create quite a few side effects. And in some cases, it can knock people out of work. The primary complaints are fatigue, headache, muscle pain, chills, and fever. And the severity of these effects really comes into with that second dose. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is as we roll this out and do planning, we have to consider, particularly for our workforce, the timing of administering the vaccine. For example, if we have a firehouse or a doctor's office and you wanna vaccinate everyone in your office or in that firehouse, you could potentially wipe out 40% of the workforce because of these side effects, which can be quite severe. They generally are short-lived, only two to three days, um, but it is something to consider when ordering and administering that vaccine. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop there. And that's just a very high level overview of our strategy and where we are right now. Okay, well, uh, obviously, as even things like today happen with the delay, the notice of the delay of the Pfizer uh, next shipments, you know, you got to you got to roll with the punches and kind of change your plans as you go. Um, is, it, is it right that the first 
if and when and likely that the Moderna vaccine is going to get approved by the FDA for emergency use this week, are they going to have available a more of a first time shipment than Pfizer, Pfizer did? Uh, yes, it'll actually be about um, twice as much, maybe a little bit more, 60% more. Um, Pfizer, we had 170,000 doses coming into the state. And with the Moderna, we have approximately 370,000 doses scheduled to come in. And it's important to note the state level is making the decision on how they are allocating this vaccine out to the public areas. Um, counties. Mm -hmm. Through each county. It, it, some places are using systems, some are counties, some are individual hospitals. So there's a lot of discussion between the state and the recipient that does not necessarily include the Department of Health locally. Um, but we do have regular routine conference calls with the states, just sometimes our information may be uh, half a step behind. Okay. Um, a lot of our members are asking questions about what about me? What about our staff? Are we in that first uh, phase of distribution of priority? And it, it looks like we are, but phase one has different levels of priority. I mean, excuse me, priority one has, has different levels. Um, I already know for sure that um, because Tampa General uh, got their doses, they are vaccinating many of their employees and physicians who are on staff there in high contact areas. So obviously they were the highest of the priority. Um, they, they do want to vaccine uh, physicians and have it available in physician's office as a initial uh, point of delivery service. But from what I understood from Scott Rifkes, the um, Surgeon General of Florida, and uh, oversees the Florida Department of Health. And what you said also, Ryan, is physicians' offices who want to be distributors of this, you have to be registered at the Florida Shots Vaccine Program. Even if, um, so if you're not, haven't done that, you need to contact the Florida Department of Health and find out how to do that. Many people already give vaccines and many offices are already registered, but you need to let them know that you're interested and capable of giving these vaccines. Most people will not have the capability of doing the Pfizer vaccine. So those probably won't be the things that we're gonna be getting in our offices. More likely the Moderna vaccine that requires the same um, temperature that we store our MMRs and hepatitis and other vaccines like that, that is adequate for the Moderna vaccine. But you have to be registered. Um, or if you're interested, you have to at least know a physician's office who is registered that you and your staff can go to. Ryan, I like, the, I like your idea that you need to keep in mind, you need to kind of um, have a, a rolling, um, a rollout of it. Not everybody go get vaccinated the same day in case side effects were to happen. Um, some other questions, Ryan. Some of these uh, are good questions that we may not have answers to, but I'm going to throw them out any, anyway. I just want to, somebody wanted to clarify is that um, to be in that first priority, you don't have to only be over 65. If you have, um, say, um, lymphoma at the age of 45, you're going to be in that first priority stage at some point also, correct? And that's actually been, um, we've asked for clarification on that. I was on a conference call this afternoon because when the governor made that first announcement, he did separate the two. It was 65 or individuals with um, underlying health conditions that could be adversely impacted by this disease. So lately in the last two days, it has been the, the word coming out of the state in these press conferences has been 65 with comorbidities. Um, I've asked for clarification on it and I, I am still awaiting. Uh, it, it's, we're looking at it from a county though as 65 and. Okay. Um, to what extent um, is Tampa General um, responsible for determining who will get these 20,000 vaccines that came well, into them on mon uh, Monday? We, months ago, we asked each hospital um, throughout the state to actually prioritize their internal staff, kind of create tiers. 
um, to look at it from like emergency department, ICU, COVID unit, um, and kind of prioritize all of their staff, which they did. So they're the ones who actually created and determined within their facilities who gets it first. Um, as more vaccine becomes available, they can move into the other tiers that they have established. Uh, we did ask them if they would be willing to share their vaccine because as a site, Tampa General, there's not 20,000 employees, but they got 20,000 vaccines. So the intent was that they also provide to other facilities until the vaccine started rolling in, which I know that they have provided to critical workers in, for example, St. Joe's, um, Advent Health Tampa, Moffitt. They have made those vaccines available to that group. Okay. Um, is there any uh, way that the general public can know which CVSs and which Walgreens will be distributing centers? Yes. Uh, be vaccination, vaccination centers. Right. And the state is, um, when we get to that point, they are creating a dedicated COVID vaccine website, which will be kind of like you can go on to Florida Flu Finder right now to find a flu vaccine. Uh, this will be dedicated to COVID and there will be a complete list of every public site that's offering it as well as people like CVS and Walgreens. And they're okay. also recruiting publics and uh, regional pharmacy chains to join into this effort as well. Yeah. Help, help the doctors uh, listening also think about another large category of people. Okay, there's um, long-term care facilities and you mentioned about 70,000 of the 100 about 60,000 of the 170,000 doses are going to long-term care facilities. There are other similar locations that have an extreme amount of elderly people, such as ALFs, skilled nursing facilities, uh, adult communities um, that have, um, you know, senior living. Um, is, has there been thoughts that stri of strike teams, I think that's what you're calling them, strike teams going out to these type of facilities? Uh, yes, sir. The long-term care facilities I was referring to, the 21 or 22,000, um, that is your ALFs and nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities. Um, so they will be taken care of. If they can vaccinate themselves, they'll be provided the vaccine, at, like at a skilled nursing. If it's an ALF, they will send those strike teams in. Are you talking about the strategy for the law, for the senior communities, for example, uh, those 55 and older? Uh, we're looking at setting up those public points of dispensing. Uh, some multiple thoughts. We can set them up geographically to make it more convenient for everyone. Um, we can set up focused ones depending on vaccine availability. One thing we ran into the other day, and I, I'll just give you the, a quick synopsis of it. Um, we had a facility or a residential community of 55 and older uh, contacted emergency management and said they wanted us to send a strike team to their community. And they wanted, when, when the vaccine was available, they understood that, but they also wanted to exclude everyone else except for their community, um, which is one thing we really would have to look at. Um, while that's still our target group, you know, we, we run into issues with, okay, if we do that, how can we exclude the person who lives across the, the wall from them um, just because they're not there? So we're looking at more of um, public open sites. We've been running influenza clinics at high schools to test our process. These are all drive-throughs and we'd be looking at doing this geographically um, in you know, one or two days in each site and then move to a different spot within that same geographic area to get more convenient. Uh, we're gonna be looking at, we have a list of all 55 and over communities in Hillsborough County. Um, so we've got those on a map. And then we also would be looking at where 
the vaccine is being offered other than these public pods. If BayCare is providing vaccines through their outpatient clinics to the, pop, to the public or that are meeting that criteria or federally qualified health centers, we're not trying to duplicate efforts. We're trying to get the vaccine out as widely spread as possible, as quickly as possible. You mentioned you have uh, those facilities and locations as dots on the map. Do they need, still need to call you to let you know that they're interested or will you be reaching out to those centers? We're gonna be reaching out to those centers and also ask them to be part of the working group that we'll be setting up. So we're not duplicating efforts and we all know what each other is doing. Okay. Um, I've read enough to know that the vaccine is not gonna be mandatory, um, but there, are some, there is a similar question. How about for the people who will be administering the vaccine? Um, is it gonna be required that they get vaccinated before they become a vaccinated or? No, it won't be required that they do, but we will definitely offer it to them. Mm -hmm. Also, um, I, we're going to be speaking more with Dr. Sennett about the um, ins and outs of the various vaccines in just a minute. But to your knowledge, is there any difference in the way that this, um, I understand this Pfizer vaccine, you have a diluent of a, a saline, I think it is, that you have to mix. Moderna is going to come pre-mixed. Um, the same injection techniques intermuscularly um, that we give other vaccines will be this way. Some people have said they have noticed on TV that the people are not doing any aspiration to make sure a vessel is not hit. Is that a concern? It is um, a concern, I'm sure. We do have training. There is training for this, which is inclusive of that. Um, one of the things that we discover early on, even when we do influenza clinics, is unless you're giving vaccines quite a bit, and it's been 20 years, you can forget. Um, but Pfizer and Moderna both have training videos. And one of the things when we are working with our contractors or you know, paramedics or whatever, we are putting them through training prior to letting them go out and administer the vaccine. Okay. Um, right now, uh, Pfizer's um, approval is based on a first dose and then a second dose uh, about 19 to 21 days later. Now with these delays, and there could be further delays in the future, any knowledge on how far apart can the doses go and still be effective? Or is that a, a question for somebody else? Um, I can give you the what we're looking at from a state perspective, but um, I can also defer to Dr. Holter, Dr. Senate on that. The state is looking at trying to standardize that time frame. So what the state is looking at for Pfizer is two days prior and up to five days at post um, for a window to receive that second vaccine. And from a standardization standpoint, from what I understand, Moderna is a little bit different, but the state has come in and said, we're gonna, their recommendation would be two days prior, five days post and just keep it all, the same. And Dr. Cromer, if I may, this is uh, Doug Holt. Um, yes. The, um, the federal government held back half. So they, there, there is enough for a second dose that will come in three weeks for that okay. first. And that's sort of their policy. They, they want to ensure that no supply uh, problems interrupts the completion of the two doses. So um, th that's that's sort of the way they have designed it. And so the delays have just been that incremental week, um, which would have been new vaccinees as uh, they come in. Okay, good, good, good answer. Thank you. Um, so many, many questions are coming across. Uh, what about me? What about me? What about my office? Um, so let me just kind of summarize what we know so far. Uh, hospitalized, uh, high-risk people are going to be the first as far as uh, healthcare care workers. Uh, a certain amount of long-term care facilities uh, with an emphasis of some in Pinellas County. And that's just with this first shipment. Um, as time goes on and people identify themselves, doctors identify themselves and corporations identify themselves of being able to store the vaccine, want to give the vaccine, those will become marketed and, and publicized and and posted. Um, you just have to stay tuned to that. We can't tell you when that will happen, um, those of you listening. Um, so if, 
I think at some point um, there will be these public arenas that will be available. That's probably going to be a little bit later. Um, so some, let's say if you're a 70-year-old and don't have a doctor um, and are just going to wait for the Raymond James to open up, that's probably going to be a little bit down the road. Is that, Am I right, Ryan? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we don't have a timeline. Um, our ability to start this effort is really based on how much vaccine we'll be receiving on a weekly basis. Um, we will probably find out the week prior how much we're anticipated to receive the following week, and then we can start scheduling. Um, if it's the Pfizer vaccine, we actually have to have it in hand before we can confirm that schedule uh, because of the limitations on storage of it. And once you open it, you've got six hours to give it. Um, uh, I'm sorry, on the Pfizer, once you bring it to room temperature, you've got six hours. Um, the Moderna is once opened at six hours. So it, it's kind of a scheduling challenge, um, but through these groups, we've done some dry runs, kind of talking it through, and we think we can do that, but the communications to the public, to the providers, to the different groups is gonna be critical as we move forward. Okay, I'd like to uh, direct some of uh, the, the, um, the webinar here to Dr. Holt. Dr. Holt, you've been vitally uh, involved in all of these planning and, and other things every day. Uh, why don't you give us an update on the local epidemiology and some things we can expect in the weeks ahead, uh, but also any other points of interest you think our listeners may, may enjoy hearing. Um, yeah, and maybe just a few comments on the vaccine. As you've heard, Ryan, I think, did a great job. Uh, we spent a long time uh, planning for what would happen. Uh, um, and the changes has been both the governor reprioritized things, significantly altered how we can implement things uh, and of the vaccine supply. Um, so we're going to continue to work to get as uh, the vaccines that come in, we'll get them um, out to be administered. The health department really doesn't have vaccine teams. Uh, and that's why we're going to be looking for partners, which can include some of the large groups here. Uh, it really does, uh, at this stage, require um, uh, a, a unified, coordinated effort to, to make this happen in this stage. Um, so um, stay tuned. The survey will be coming. We'll be asking how many staff you have. We may be asking if you have any hospital affiliations or other things. We're going to be looking at locally what we can do to, to, to um, provide vaccines to our medical community. Um, moving on to the epidemiology, um, the uh, one thing I would um, uh, mention that within a week or so, uh, the health department is going to send out weekly surveillance reports, kind of like what we do with the flu, uh, and they'll be distributed through what we call our epi notes um, and through an email. So uh, I know um, the Medical Society gets some of those. We'll make sure that um, if you'd like to be on that list, uh, um, uh, I would encourage you because it really gives you some nice data, uh, just like the health department or the county dashboard. Looking at the cases uh, per day on a seven-day average, we are now up over uh, almost 580 cases a day. Um, that is approximately, they we're getting close to where the peaks we saw in early July. Our positivity rate is now over 8%, uh, and we are testing a lot more people which is generating more cases, not doesn't create cases, we just find the cases that are there. Um, and that's particularly in the antigen group. And when you look the ages, um, the majority of our cases are the highest rate, I should say, uh, per pop, for their 100,000 of their population is our 25 to 34 year olds. But this is increasing across all ages, uh, including the um, 
teenagers, which is impacting our schools. Mm -hmm. The one exception is uh, somewhat fortunately is the um, over 65. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, uh, our Hispanic populations are disproportionately affected on a per capita basis. They're about twice as likely to be positive. Um, our admissions um, are creeping up. Uh, we're looking at uh, about 30 um, admissions a day. Uh, that's uh, below our peak. Um, the good news is they're discharging about as many as they admit. So our census is pretty stable around 200, 250 uh, per day across the county. We peaked at 450 in July. Um, the uh, reasons I think for that is we're not uh, having the long-term care uh, mobilization when we did our widespread testing that generated a lot of hospital admissions. We are testing and our cases are being found in younger and the hospitals are getting um, much better at determining who needs to be admitted um, versus um, earlier on. Uh, our deaths are approaching uh, 1,000 cumulatively. Um, these are a lagging indicator. Um, we're not really seeing an increase in that at this time. So uh, there's no reason to think we're going to see uh, this improve. Uh, most of this surge is from the Thanksgiving time and we're entering the other the coming holiday season. So um, we're going to have a lot more infections out there. Hopefully um, the, the medical managements, the hospitals and others will continue to be able to, to, to meet that challenge. Um, Dr. Kramer, I'll stop there. Okay. Any comment or, or expectations for January, the numbers um, increasing even more before this whole vaccine rollout is put into place? Yeah, we've looked at the, uh, I mean, the, the USF does a very nice job. We're, we will include that in our uh, epi notes um, where they have looked at uh, future forecasting and they're expecting the peaks uh, to occur. Um, uh, we'll start seeing um, significant increases in the early part of July with potentially peaks in the latter part of, of um, I mean, Jan you meant January? Okay. January, I'm sorry, early January. And uh, by the end of January, we could see the, the peak of the peak, if you will. Uh, at that rate, the numbers for us could be uh, twice what we're seeing now. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Holt. Uh, Dr. John Sennett, uh, you are uh, very knowledgeable along the vaccination uh, type of history, not only for the COVID-19, but other vaccines too. But could you give us a rundown on um, the ins and outs of these vaccines, as well as others that may be coming down the pike? Sure. Uh there are multiple uh, vaccines in development. Uh, I want to preface this by saying that no epidemic or pandemic has ever been controlled by vaccination. There has to be continued social isolation and mask wearing. It's vaccination programs that stop pandemics, not vaccines. Uh, for instance, with the new vaccine, it's unclear if you can become a carrier and not become sick. Example of that is diphtheria, where you're vaccinated against the toxin, but many people carry Crinobacterium diphtheria on their tonsils, and the labs routinely grow it. Um, secondly, um, in the face of a big exposure, Vaccines are sometimes not effective. We know that from measles and some other ones, that when you get a mass inoculation, your immune system just gets overwhelmed. Um, so I think masks are going to become a part of our society for a while to come. Now, the other thing I wanted to make a point of is that this is... Uh, really an incredible miracle. If someone had told me we would have a vaccine within a year, 
I would have bet them my house we wouldn't have. That wouldn't be possible. But yet with these new mRNA vaccines, it is. Uh, the reason is that mRNA is much easier to manufacture. The only issue with mRNA is it's very heat sensitive. RNA is not made to be a genetic material. It's made to work intracellularly. So all of these mRNA vaccines are going to be frozen vaccines, either frozen with the diluent or frozen without. If you look at the data on Moderna and Pfizer, they're actually pretty similar um, about what you'd expect from what you would call the same vaccine platform. Uh, the mechanism is that they're uh, coated with lipids, they're injected when they're manufactured, they're injected into a human and they're taken up by the muscle cells in the deltoid muscle. You then produce small amounts of spike protein, theoretically forever. So there is a possibility that both Pfizer and Moderna would actually be lifetime vaccines. Um, now, is there a difference? Would you pick one over the other? Uh, I, there's no guarantee Moderna is going to come out fine. Uh, Pfizer's out and being used. So if you can get the Pfizer, you should get it. If not, we'll, in a month, we'll know what's going on with Moderna. Um, there is a thought in the scientific community that Pfizer has over half a century of designing and making vaccines, manufacturing. Whereas Moderna is only 10 years old and has never marketed a product before and has never conducted studies on that scale. Um, and I don't know what it means, but the Wall Street Journal pointed out that right after the stock prices went up, the president of the company sold all of his stock, <laughs> which doesn't seem very optimistic to me, but whatever. Um, other vaccines coming down the pike are uh, similar to vaccines produced in China, which are more traditional vaccines using killed protein, inactivated protein that you develop antibodies to. These are well tolerated, they're inexpensive to make, inexpensive to ship, and easy to give. We don't know how long the protection afforded by those vaccines are. The Chinese obviously feel that they're um, highly effective and in one weekend in Wuhan, they vaccinated 75,000 healthcare workers. So, it's a huge country with a different medical system. Um, so for right now, to me, uh, I'm almost sure Moderna will be approved Thursday. They've been very optimistic and they have a bunch of vaccine prepared and ready to ship. So we should get that in over the weekend or Monday or Tuesday, and we'll begin giving that. And with that, again, the government is making them withhold half the doses to follow up in case there's a manufacturing glitch. The side effects for the first shot uh, are pain at the injection. So, um, sometimes a low-grade fever, myalgias, and headache. Now, you'll read about the side effects in the large Pfizer study uh, of the first one of about 18,000 patients, there were five episodes of side effects. And I was intrigued by the fact that two of them were in the placebo group. So, and three in the real vaccine. So these side effects are so minimal and the disease, the illness 
can be so catastrophic that side effects should not dissuade anyone from getting vaccinated. Uh, from talking to people that have gotten the second dose of Pfizer vaccine, it's more uncomfortable, but you get astronomic antibody levels, which should be and reflected by the data, are 95% effective even in elderly patients and in immunosuppressed patients. Uh, also with the Pfizer vaccine, according to the Centers for Disease Control, uh, if a pregnant woman is in a high risk group, it's up to her if she wants to take the vaccine. And since the disease is clearly worse than the vaccine, in consultation with OB, she should probably take it. Lactating mothers, it has no effect and it's not excreted in breast milk, so it's irrelevant to them. Dr. Sinan, is it correct that this, these are the first two vaccines that have been using this messenger RNA system? And is there a danger in that fact that they are the first and we really don't have any experience with messenger RNA in vaccines? We have very little experience in humans. Uh, there's extensive um, animal studies using mRNA. This does not integrate into the genome. It stays in the endoplasmic reticulum where it's translated into spike proteins. Um, you know, RNA doesn't go into DNA. It's the primary rule is DNA, RNA. Uh, it doesn't violate that. And we don't see any way that could. Um, although it's a new platform, um, they were able to have the first doses for animals ready really within seven weeks of the virus being sequenced January 30th, which is astonishing. You alluded to this fact, but is it right that right now we do not know how long your protection will last after getting a two-dose series? Is that correct? That's correct. Now recall that Pfizer, to get the vaccine out with the resources they had, um, they looked at a two-month follow-up. Uh, 98 to 99% of adverse effects from vaccines are noted within the first two months. And that was the data submitted to the FDA. I don't see why there should be a long-term side effect profile, but they're certainly following everyone now for two years that gets their vaccine. And Moderna has said they're going to do the same thing, has said it, I've not seen it in writing. What are the parameters um, that have been mentioned for people who've had COVID already or presently have COVID? Um, should they receive the vaccine and when? They should uh, talk to their primary care doctor. The um, antibody responses to natural infection are like everything else we know about this virus, very variable. Some people have a great immune response, some do not. Currently, uh, my opinion would be if you're two months out, it's probably a good idea to get vaccinated. Two months out. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because of the variability of the response, you don't know how long you're gonna be having, carrying your antibodies around, but a safe bet is two to three months after your illness, okay. Um, do you want to give us any update on the uh, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine? What's what's some of the specifics about it? Is it going to be a two dose series? Um, the Oxford vaccine will be two doses. Notice all the doses are time to respond at the peak of our immune response to boost it. So, in other words, when your re immune response peaks, your body says, "Wait a minute." who have contributed enough time and energy to this, let's back off. 
So just when your body is slowing down production, that three to four week period, you get rechallenged, and then you get uh, what's called an amplified response. It's more than twofold. It's actually a logarithmic difference. With one dose, you're clearly protected for two months with the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, we don't know about Moderna. With two doses, both of them give you about 95% protection uh, over two months, uh, which is very good. It might even be higher than that because in, it seemed to me looking at what was submitted to the FDA that early on the results were not as good as later. And you have to wonder, was it refrigerated exactly the right way? Did we have the right dose, et cetera? Now I think it's going to be higher. And for both vaccines, they're both highly active for people over 65, which is not true for influenza, measles, mumps, et cetera. And it's thought that the average person has one corona vac infection a year as a, as a minor cold, that's what they're known for. So a 70 year old has really had 70 experiences with coronaviruses. And that's one reason they can get into trouble with such a profound immune response with ARDS. The pulmonary aspect of this illness is purely immune. There's no infectious virus involved in that. That's uh, due to leaky capillaries from virus infecting the endothelium. No one, mm -hmm. I guess someone could be, but in general, uh, people are not contagious after eight to 10 days of onset of symptoms. Now their immune system is going to make them feel bad for two weeks or more, but the virus is not viable. Mm -hmm. I read this, the uh, Pfizer study, the, or at least the um, synopsis that they presented to the FDA. Looks like a 44,000 uh, people, uh, have, about half of those were placebo. Uh, seems like uh, even though there were many um, races and ethnic groups represented, um, not every ethnic group was, rep was represented. Is there any reason to think that the vaccine may not work as well? in some ethnic groups or in people over 65 rather than under 65? Um, what are your thoughts on the different, different stratification uh, well, responses? None of the Pfizer endpoints looked at the racial distribution. They did include that data in the body of the report. And in it, we find that both Pfizer and Moderna have um, very good responses in African Americans, which, which was of great concern because they're adversely affected by the virus. Also in the Latinx population, they also are protected. And it seems these are both, um, and what you'd expect uh, really, the first vaccines out are usually the most potent, but have the most discomfort and the most side effects. And each year they fine tune it, it gets a little better. But certainly none of the vaccine discomfort would compare to the illness itself. Mm -hmm. There's some quite other questions come in. One came in here for Dr. Holt. Dr. Holt, just as if the, just as the Hillsborough County Health Department um, participated in testing, is any of the health department centers going to participate in vaccinations? The, so you, you're department asking sites. Our, our specific sites. Um, probably not in the first, in the early phases. Uh, uh, we would become more in the late phases um, and um, be focusing again on our populations, just like we are in other normal vaccination times. Um, our sites are really are you know, not equipped or, or to, the, uh, to, to the degree that uh, we would need to do a public vaccines. Um, 
So I think uh, what we're trying to do is leverage our relationships and working in partnerships to provide what we can, which is access to the vaccine, technical assistance, and um, you know, um, in this early stage. Okay. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all three for joining us tonight, and for all of our participants uh, for listening in. Um, I do want to say that you have the, the word of the Hillsborough County Medical Association that we're going to do what we can over these next couple weeks as information comes in, as vaccination supplies come in, of educating our members where they can go to get them and their staffs vaccinated. There's not a definite answer right now. Um, Ryan will talk later on how we can assist with this survey and also um, stay tuned to the HCMA uh, e newsletters that come out on a on a weekly basis, so you can know when and um, how to get you and your staff vaccinated. Thank you for joining us tonight. And um, as we uh, are very aware, now is not the time to let our guard down. Continue to wear our mask. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thank you.